there are cycles, and uh, I'm going to refer to um, general, general ideas and some more specific ideas. And the cycles are like out of nowhere, boom, some small group kind of ignored beforehand just explodes and grows and spreads. And this is sort of the, the pioneers as they're bursting out. And then they go and con they, they conquer a whole bunch of areas. And then because they've conquered a whole bunch of areas, you get this free trade zone, which really, really boosts income. And then because there is all of this uh, age of commerce, then they, everybody gets rich and then they get lazy, right? <laughs> Civilization, as the saying goes, uh, climbs in iron shoes and descends in silk slippers. And when you have lots of money, you want to start spending the money on helping the poor, but that is not how the money was accumulated. The money was accumulated by hard work and self-discipline and taking it from responsible people and giving it to usually less responsible people, or you could say less intelligent people, is a form of dysgenics which sows the seed of the decline of the society. There is, when societies become rich, and this is not true just of Rome, but of um, uh, some of the ancient Arab uh, empires, um, that there's this spread of higher education. And rather than virtue and action, there is this interminable engagement in intellectual debate. But these intellectual arguments, they rarely lead to any kind of agreement because people just take their positions, they get defensive, they get hostile, and nobody gets won over to anyone else. And um, it's kind of tragic. You know, way back in the day, you used to have just a very few number of elite intellectual uh, institutions, you know, Harvard and Cambridge and Oxford and so on. And now it's like every city, every town, every block, it sometimes seems that. So through this process of debate rather than action, there tends to be an intensification of hostilities in the political realm. Uh, and of course, because the government has more money, more people want to rush in to control it, just as when the state controls religion, all the religious groups wanted to control the state to impose their version of religion on everyone else. So because the government has become so wealthy and has the power to print money, which is the most powerful and destructive um, ability that governments gain, everybody wants to control the government, and therefore there are no compromises possible, and there's a hardening and opposition of political hatreds. There is uh, an influx of uh, foreigners, right? Because it's a wealthy region, Rome and, and Greece and, and the West. It's wealthy, so people want to get in. And so there's an end to sort of cultural or ethnic homogeneity, which is fine until the money begins to run out, and then, boom, you get all of these hostilities that are occurring. Old tribalism returns, and all of this hostility happens. And so if we look at way back at Arab empires in Baghdad in the golden days of Harum al-Rashid, the uh, Arabs were actually a minority in the capital imperial city of Istanbul. And um, this is in the great days or in the significant or powerful days of Ottoman rule. So Istanbul had very few descendants of Turkish conquerors in its capital. And we can just look at New York and just walk around the streets of New York and see how many descendants of the Pilgrim Fathers are around. Well, not that many. There also is a great shift in who is considered popular, in who is considered famous, in who is considered worthy of attention. And this is, again, all over the place throughout history. The heroes of empires in seemingly terminal decline are always the same. You got your athlete, you got your singer, you got your pretty person, you got your actor. And that is... Um, Always the case. What happens is it's no longer literary heroes or intellectual heroes. It's no longer military heroes. Uh, it, none of those iron-willed, strong-willed, genius people are around. It's people who please the eye, who please the ear, who please the senses. Right? They make pretty sounds with their mouths. They look pretty and so on. And they um, have nice muscles. They're athletes and so on. And so this is a debasement of the culture and is reflective of the hedonism. People don't want examples of heroes who achieved their uh, moral or, or military expertise and power through uh, discipline and surrendering their own ego to the benefit of the tribe. What they want to see is, you know, people who are born pretty, born athletic. You know, athletes work hard and so on, but it's not quite the same as moral excellence, and that's one thing that is uh, pretty common throughout these kinds of things. Now, here's a quote an increase in the influence of women in public life has often been associated with national decline. The later Romans complained that although Rome ruled the world, women ruled Rome. 
In the 10th century, a similar tendency was observed in the Arab Empire, the women demanding admission to the professions hitherto monopolized by men. What, wrote the contemporary historian Ibn Bessan, have the professions of clerk, tax collector, or preacher to do with women? These occupations have always been limited to men alone. Many women practiced law, while others obtained posts as university professors. There was an agitation for the appointment of female judges, which, however, does not appear to have succeeded. Soon after this period, government and public order collapsed, and foreign invaders overran the country. The resulting increase in confusion and violence made it unsafe for women to move unescorted in the streets, with the result that this feminist movement collapsed. I leave you to ponder that one, and please let me know what you think in the comments. And when there's this age of affluence, right, after there's this explosion and this expansion and then this uh, commerce uh, and then this um, uh, wealth, well, the government starts scooping up the wealth and handing it out. Uh, in the Arab Empire of Baghdad, there was state assistance to the young, to the poor, they have free university, free public hospitals, and this seems to help people in the short run, but it really tends to dissolve their resolution and strength in the long run. We all want free, but free ain't usually that good for us. So it's not biological because after about close to a century of peace, right, from the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815 to the start of the Second World War, First World War, sorry, in 1914, there was rich aristocratic young British men and they actually moved fairly easily into the hellish life in the frontline trenches in World War I. So it's not physical. If you move from a decadent culture to a more rigorous culture, you'll adjust pretty uh, quickly. When you have a lot of wealth and power, you get lazy. You get, and interestingly enough, people don't tend to be happier. Uh, women's happiness uh, over the past 40 or 50 years has declined enormously, particularly in America. As they've had more choices, more opportunities, their happiness tends to decline, and this has happened to others, other groups as well. There's pessimism, there's frivolity, there's hedonism, there's materialism, and there is a decline of religion. And that is pretty significant. Unless there's a good substitute like philosophy, it, declines in religion tend to be declines in virtue. And what happens is there's this sort of, it's like amber slowly floating over or flowing over a ancient uh, insect. You know, people, they really don't rouse themselves to save their own civilizations, even when the dangers are completely obvious. Because I'm not sure they really feel that anything is worth saving at this point. And it seems to run at about 10 generations. 10 generations takes us from these sort of hardy, hardworking, clear the land no matter what, enterprising pioneers into the lazy couch surfing dependence of the welfare state. It takes about 10 generations to go from that. And we can see this repeated over and over throughout history. So there are principles. This is sort of my final speech. Thank you so much for having the patience to go through this. I hope it's been helpful and interesting. And if you find itself, of course, please donate freedomainradio.com slash donate to help us continue to do this kind of work and share and like and subscribe, you know, all of the good stuff. So a people grow to greatness because they follow rational principles, equality, rationality, empiricism, free trade. And these, it's not people who are the livestock. It's not people who are the productive aspects of society. It's these principles. We have to work to recognize it's these principles that we must work to grow and extend and expand. And that, of course, is the entire point of philosophy. And when you have a welfare state, you have a giant vacuum of demand right, that comes in. People want to rush to fill in and take advantage of that welfare state. So one government program called the welfare state leads to inevitably another government program called walls or defense and so on. And the welfare state leads to increased military requirements, increased policing and so on, because you get people pouring in who don't want to come for the values, they want to come for the money that the values have produced. So what happens is you get the welfare state, which is very expensive, that stimulates demand for people to come into your country or into your culture, which means you've got to build walls, you've got to have enforcement, you've got to push people out, you've got to bust them, you've got to police them, you've got to round them up. So you get this ever escalating sense of cost in society as well. Of course, massive immigration also depresses wages. That's very well understood, which means with the welfare state plus depressed wages, fewer people want to work, which means your tax base shrinks. Because they don't want to work, they want to go in the welfare state. Your tax base shrinks at the same time as your expenses are going through the roof. 
Because the government has the unique ability to enter into intergenerational contracts, in particular in the modern age, you think of the um, municipal issued bonds and there are some around the world that are 75 years in the future. Well, what politician wouldn't want to spend money now and like two and a half generations from now, oh, somebody's going to have to pay maybe if they're still around. So freedom produces wealth and then the state scoops up that excess wealth, uses it as collateral to borrow against the future, thus ensuring the decline. Universalism. Ah, oh, very complex and I'll just mention this briefly. Universalism, the idea that the values are equally applicable to everyone at all times is a great challenge. And I have yet to see how this translates into reality. And I say this as somebody who hugely values universalism. But does universalism work? Does it work? Look at the empires that were conquered by the West. How are they doing now? Have they absorbed all the values of the West? Have they continued along those lines? Not really. Uh, America we could say, theoretically, with some decent intentions, went in and tried to replace the tyranny of Saddam Hussein's regime in Iraq with a free, equal, and peaceful democracy. Did it take? Well, no. I mean, it's been a complete disaster. It's a government program called Bringing Freedom, and what it did was create and bring ISIS. But uh, does it really work? Can we communicate through reason and evidence and transfer values that way? I remain doubtful, and I've got a whole presentation called The Death of Reason on some reasons as to why that occurs. I'm not saying I know what the solution is. I'm just saying this idea that universalists will just tell them about all these values and they'll all be just like us doesn't seem to work. So we are going to be free or we are going to collapse. I'm, I'm telling you this as a basic historical fact. There is not one exception throughout history, not one regime, not one empire that has continued um, restricting the freedoms of its citizens, particularly their economic freedoms, uh, which has not collapsed. And as we see the escalating growth and power of the state in the West, increasing layers of bureaucracy, increasing layers of regulation, increasing complexities of taxes, and price controls, which are, are going on fairly regularly, and if, um, one form of price control is the minimum wage, and all these sorts of disasters are occurring. So once we accept this, that we either become free or we collapse, then we have one job, which is to promote and extend freedom through peaceful and rational means, as best we can. And the last thing that I want to say is that people complain, I mentioned this at the beginning, people complain, they say, well, nobody learns anything from history. Well, it's like because nobody tells the truth about history. Nobody tells the truth about what happened in Rome and why it fell. Because if they did tell the truth about what happened in Rome and why it fell, we would have to shrink the size and power of the state in the here and now. And hey, don't you notice that government teachers, both in the uh, government run and regulated and controlled, primary uh, schools and high schools and so on, government teachers don't really tell you the truth about how to shrink the size and power of the state as a whole. Of course not. It's a conflict of interest. Uh, in universities, which are state-sponsored, state-protected, state-controlled, state-subsidized, you find that a lot of teachers are on the left and don't want to talk about limiting government power. Of course not, because the government is the source of their wealth and authority to a large degree. And so you're simply not going to get the truth about history from people inside the system that are feeding off state power. The, um, the parasite does not want to teach you how to detach it from the host, because that's become its job, which is to continue to suck the brain and blood and bone marrow and money and future and children from the host. So you're not going to get the truth about history from government institutions and from government protected privileged classes like academics. The truth is that the West has brought by far the greatest values to the world. The values of science, the values of reason, the values of the free market, the values of modern medicine, the values of capitalism. It's not that only the West had these, but the West did the most in promulgating and extending these values. Philosophy as a whole is to a large degree a Western tradition, at least empirical, syllogistical, Socratic, method-based philosophy. So, if you come from the West, there are a lot of heroes in your ancestry. Your ancestors brought great goods to the world. And you've heard about the evils, and they're there, but you need to hear about the goods. They brought great goods to the world. You are the offspring and the descendants of many heroes, of many brave souls, who fought very hard to bring and extend the freedoms you now enjoy. If you feel that you are descended from evil, you have nothing in your civilization to defend. You are 
children of heroes. And only heroes get to keep their freedoms. <laughs>